Hello and welcome to the Internet of Things Made Simple. I'm Laraboy Humor. This is episode number 14. Thanks for joining us. Shout out to our new listeners. Welcome aboard. As always, check out our new webpage, the Internet of Things Made Simple.com, which has some incredible material on IoT. And I kindly ask you to subscribe to this podcast using your favorite podcast service. In our main segment tonight, we're going to cover the top 10 things you need to know before you decide to buy an IoT gateway in 2019. This includes things like connectivity, the choice of how you're going to power it, and much more. It goes very well with episode 15 and 16, which are upcoming, which is a comprehensive guide on how to select the best IoT network for your device. In those two episodes, we're going to cover seven cellular-based options, yes, there are seven, and seven non-cellular options. We're going to cover some key points about each, both good, bad, and a couple times ugly, as well as some key applications for each technology. In the end, it got so comprehensive, we had to spread it over two episodes, so be sure to tune in for that. Tonight, we're going to talk about, do we need to regulate the use of robots, including making them undergo standard tests before we allow them to replace a human? In a previous episode, I made the case of how robots were smart and motivated, and humans are dumb and lazy. I thought I'd get much more negative feedback, but the feedback I received was mostly positive. As I stated that once we start to judge robots the same as humans, we will come to accept that they're better at most things than humans. One important point that I didn't really point out that needs to be pointed out came from feedback from one of my regular listeners, all the way from South Africa. They stated, if you're judging robots the same as humans, do we need to hold them to the same standard as humans? Do they need to take things like board exams or even driving tests? It's an interesting point, and a very valid one. I know there's been a ton of testing by companies in terms of autonomous cars, but will they have a comprehensive understanding of the rules of the road for your particular jurisdiction? I think it's quite reasonable for them to have to take a test in each jurisdiction, and for each system to undergo similar quality testing. As well, if a robot's going to replace a worker that's expected to have some sort of certification or training, it's quite reasonable to expect that the robot should be held to the same standards. I mean, fair is fair. If they're going to be treated equally, they need to be tested equally. When we come back from a short break, we're going to go over the top 10 things you need to know or consider before buying a gateway in 2019. Back in a few seconds. Okay, welcome back. As mentioned, we plan on helping you choose a network for the next two episodes. But for now, we're going to focus on the gateway itself. So for those of you who are wondering as a starting point, is a gateway a modem? The answer is that it is, and then some. Modems, which is the term that I still use personally, refers to a device that is intended to provide connectivity, which all gateways definitely do. Gateways differentiate themselves by offering things like advanced security, multiple connection ports, programmability, and over-the-air controllability. So this list refers to gateways, but if you feel more comfortable calling them a modem, that's your preference. Finally, before we go on to the list, I wanted to point out two things. There's going to be a webinar version of this, so if you want to see pretty pictures and not just hear me talk, it's going to be up on Novatech's webpage, which is novatech.com slash webinar, sometime around end of February, early March. The second thing I wanted to point out is there's no order of importance to this list. Depending on your deployment, each of these items may be the deciding factor or might not be a factor at all. So on to number one, the first thing you want to consider is which radio technology to use. And as I mentioned, we're going to cover the 14 options in much more detail, but here's some basics for now. There are ones that offer higher speed, you know, starting with 3G, 4G, and soon 5G. There are ones that are optimized for secure lower bandwidth applications like Cat1, CatM, and eventually NB1 or NBIoT. And there's even low speed dedicated non cellular networks like Sigfox and LoRa. On the non cellular side, you have the old reliables, you know, Ethernet, Wi Fi, Bluetooth. Each of these have a very strong following and can be very great choices in many applications. Alternatively, private radio and satellite are commonly used in many industrial applications and in most remote applications. Your choice needs to factor in things like how much bandwidth you need now and what might you need in the future. So if your plan is just to monitor a simple device now, but you know you might need to put in a video camera down the road, you might want to opt for a higher speed modem today. 
it's just cheaper than having to go out there and put a second modem in and have downtime. You're also going to want to factor in power usage. The more power is used by the higher bandwidth networks, you're going to want to factor in where you're deploying it, where's their coverage today, how long will that coverage be in place, and of course your budget. If your budget is bare bones, you're not going to go for a 5G device. But we're going to cover that much more in the episodes on networks. So for number two, the vast majority of electronic equipment is designed to work to what I call consumer standards, which means that it's optimally used in a controlled environment. Yeah, you might take out your phone on a really cold or really hot day, but it's definitely not built for that. Many IoT applications have to work in pretty tough conditions, so the temperature specification for your device is point number two. If you're always going to be using it in a warm environment, which we refer to as a carpeted environment, then a consumer-grade device might be all you need. If you're looking for more durability, and or if you're going to be using the device in some unknown locations, a commercial-grade device is then ideal. These usually have the chops, as I referred to, to work down to temperatures like minus 20, and they can handle most places in the heat of summer. However, if you really want to beat the snot out of your devices, you know, desert heat, the cold of a northern Canadian winter, hot and humid days in New Orleans, you're going to want to use an industrial grade device. These devices can also handle almost jackhammer like vibration. In terms of price, yes, you're going to pay more for a commercial grade device over a consumer one and often a fair amount more for an industrial grade device. It is important to remember though, that even though these devices do cost more, they do hold up very well in many tough environments. As well, they often tend to last about two to three times as long, and that can mean your application will be more cost-effective over time. Number four, similar to most devices being consumer grade and durability, they also almost all plug into the wall for power. The term is AC power, And AC is the most common things in our lives. Just try to get a plug at an airport terminal. You'll know what I'm talking about. Everyone's plugging in something. However, many deployments don't have the option of an available plug. They might use a generator, a solar panel, or an in-vehicle application. In that case, they need to use what's called DC. And DC power is the optimal choice. The good thing is that virtually every gateway has the ability to handle the fluctuations that a DC connection brings. Finally, once the domain of the IT world, PoE, or power over Ethernet, has seen a huge surge in popularity in the world of IoT gateways. If you're not familiar with it, this pushes down the power and the data across the same Ethernet cable, and this allows for a flexibility in placement. So imagine the best place to place your device is nowhere near where the power source is. This allows you to place it where you like. This can often mean that you can reduce the length of your antenna cable, And the antenna cable can be many times more expensive per foot or meter than an Ethernet cable. So not only does this help to boost your signal, it can help to reduce the deployment cost. Number five, this was a choice you definitely had to make up front a few years ago, but you might not have to now. And that was the choice of which cellular carrier you're putting the device on. Back then, devices left the manufacturer with software on board that prevented it from being easily moved from one carrier to the other. Today, with the introduction of 4G, switching carriers is easier than ever before, so you don't have to decide the carrier before purchase. However, since many parts of the world use different bands and frequency ranges, you need to check to make sure that your gateway can work in multiple continents, and that's if you're deploying it there, or if there's a chance that your device might roam into those areas. If that's the case, doing some research up front will reduce your headaches down the road. When we come back from a short break, we're going to cover points 6 to 10, including the incredible breadth of ports that's available to connect devices to gateways today, the differences between a fixed and a mobile gateway, and how people are using two SIMs to maximize uptime. Back in a few seconds. Okay, welcome back. For point number six, even the most non-technical person might understand Bluetooth. They may not know the name Bluetooth, but they understand it's some kind of magic that allows your headset to talk to your phone. And that's in the case of my parents anyway, so they at least understand it. However, very few non-hardcore IoT people are familiar with inputs and outputs. This is a shame, as they can be a very easy way to retrieve valuable sensor and basic IoT information. So in case you're asking, what is an input-output? Let's just start with inputs. Inputs are able to receive information from devices to let you know that a key activity has happened or the level of a key container, as an example. 
There are two different types of input, digital and analog, but I'll try to keep it non-nerdy here. Digital lets you know of a change of state, and there are only two states. It's either on or an off. Think of a light switch. It's either on or off. When the status changes, it lets you know. So in the case of a door opening, it will let you know that the door is opened or the door has been closed. In the case of a tow truck's boom being lifted, you can be notified of that, or a parking gate being used after hours. Analog inputs are a little bit different because unlike only two states, they work on a range. So they may tell you how much liquid is in a tank, like in the case of a propane tank, how much grain is in a storage silo. I think you get the understanding there. Outputs are a little different because this is where you're initiating the conversation. In the other case, it will send you an alarm if something happens. Now you're saying, I want to send a command to the modem to have something happen on my behalf. So an example, you might send a pulse or a notification to the gateway to say, unlock that door, let this person in. Finally, one of the advancements in gateways is the incredible ability for logic and programming to be done on board. Again, don't want to get too nerdy here, but in the past, you had to have different controllers and different things on site to keep track of traffic or how many times a door was opened. When you combine input outputs with the fact that you can put some nerdy software on board, this can often reduce the amount of devices you need at a site, and this can reduce the overall cost of the application. On to point number seven, fixed or mobile? That is the question. Okay, in all seriousness, it's not that important of a question, but it might be an important decision you have to make. Many applications start off in a fixed area and then end up being deployed in a mobile environment. So say as an example, you've got a restaurant and you're using a cellular connection to back up your point of sale. And then you decide, yeah, you know what? I don't want to run a restaurant anymore. I always wanted to do a food truck. And now you want to move your connectivity onto the food truck. Well, that introduces some new conditions that you're probably not used to. Does that matter? Does that same device just easily work in both environments? Well, the good thing is that most gateways, especially the commercial and industrial grade ones you might remember from earlier, have the durability and the chops to handle either scenario. No issues there. However, there are features on board mobile gateways that make them more appealing to be used in a mobile environment. So say in the case of a police cruiser or a city bus. The first thing that comes to mind is GPS. And that's the same software or same technology that you use to be able to find out where Starbucks is. In this case, it's able to transmit the GPS location of that vehicle, which helps to increase productivity so you know you guys are where they're supposed to be, and equally important, it increases safety. Some of the higher-end devices offer features like Dead Reckoning, which I always found to be the funniest name, by the way, but this allows you to get accurate locations even when GPS signals are not available. There's a few different places that GPS is not available. Sometimes you don't have to be anywhere particular. If you're in a downtown core, there's a lot of windows bouncing signals off. It creates what's called an urban canyon. So you can be lost GPS even in downtown Manhattan. People most think about parking garages and underground tunnels for dead reckoning. What happens is that when you lose GPS coverage, it looks after how fast you were going, what angles did you turn the wheels, all those different things. And it calculates it in a really nerdy way to give a positioning which is pretty accurate on where you are when GPS is not available. Finally, if you have to choose between fixed and mobile gateways and you're really not sure, my advice, and it's not always, but this is usually a good guess, is to opt for the mobile focus gateway as you can use the mobile gateway in a fixed environment and a mobile environment with no issues. The only consideration you have to have is that if you use a mobile environment in a fixed location, that mobile gateway has to be able to be powered by AC. And as I mentioned earlier, most devices can work on both anyways. On to number eight. IT guys have hated cellular for a long time. They hated smartphones because now it opens up the whole idea of devices never come back. uh, They're mobile. How do I control things? They solved that a long time ago. IoT was always even worse for them because the device is fixed. It's not coming back. It didn't use the same platforms. They didn't love it. What you're starting to see now is some applications that allow IT guys to relax a little bit 
and to be able to control the devices much better. So number eight is over the air control. By default, most IoT gateways offer a free way to manage them, and that's referred to as a one-to-one -one management tool. This means you had to make changes to each device one by one. If you had two, four, eight devices, it might not be a big deal. But when you got to dozens, hundreds, or especially thousands, it really sucked. The next level up is something called one-to-many. And this is where you can make the changes to all devices at once. Say you want to change the reporting schedule, update firmware, whatever it might be, you can do it all with one click. That's great. What's the downside? It's not free. At least in most cases, it's not free. But if you have enough devices, and or if you make a lot of changes, it's really easy to justify. Many of these services are cloud-based by default, which, let's face it, most of our life is based on the cloud for individuals and for companies, so it's not really a big deal. Some organizations, however, have restrictions, and that's namely the government and especially public safety. In those cases, they're not allowed to put things onto the cloud. So manufacturers are starting to offer standalone management software that can be purchased and hosted by them. For number nine, I'm going to put two things into one category here, namely because they're similar, but there is some differences, but there's kind of an overlap here. So I put them both in the same category. And I'm referring to network redundancy and dual SIM deployments. Both of them have the same goal. They want to make your deployment more reliable, but they do it in a different way. Network redundancy is when you have two completely separate networks using different network infrastructure and backbones to create a primary and secondary relationship. It could be a combination of wired, wireless, or satellite. The most common combination is a wired connection, so your DSL, cable, fiber, and some kind of a cellular-based backup. There's some routing that has to be done to detect when that main connection is not available and then make the switch over to the backup connection and then come back again when the primary is available. Traditionally, this was always done by a router, but increasingly it's being done on the cellular gateway. And that's opened up this application for companies that maybe were too small or the location didn't justify putting a full-blown router in. Dual SIM has two separate connections but the difference is they're both hosted on the same cellular gateway and both connections are cellular based. This is very common in applications like railway switching stations. The setup can be primary secondary, just like in the failover solution, but in many cases, both SIMs are used at once to maximize throughput speed. Expect this to become even more common with 5G, which offers speeds that make it much more feasible to cut the wire. Okay, number 10, you're just about done. I'm kind of tired of talking anyways, and I'm sure you're tired of listening to me, so let's get through this one. This one's a bit nerdy, and I'm going to do my best to not talk or anybody, but still keep it interesting for the more technical people. And that is, are you using your gateway in bridge or router mode? In case you just said, what the, what's the difference? I have no idea what they are. I'm going to walk you through this, not to worry. And I'm going to use the example of your home internet setup. Many landline providers, so your DSL or cable provider, gives you a little box. It's a gateway, and this lets you on to the wired network. In many cases, this box or gateway has a built-in Wi-Fi connection, and many people just use that one. They power up, it gives a Wi-Fi, it's all in one, it works great. If that's the case, you're using that gateway in router mode. It's the one taking up the connectivity from your landline provider splitting it up among your devices, no problem. I think that's pretty easy to understand. However, many people opt for their own Wi-Fi router. Like in the case of gamers who have you know, huge traffic demands, maybe you have more than one device and you wanna share things locally and it's just easier to use the Wi-Fi router of your choice. In this case, the Wi-Fi router that you bought does all the slicing of your connection, all the routing, and it knows when to send information out to the internet or to a local device around you. You're just using that landline ga gateway that they gave you for internet connectivity. So in this case, the landline gateway is not a router, it's a bridge, or it's working in bridge mode. And this enables connectivity to your router. It's a bit more than that, but I think that's a decent overview. Cellular gateways need to be able to work in both bridge and router mode. 
In the past, not many could work in router mode. They were just designed to be dumb devices, like the modem I referred to earlier. Gateways are much more intelligent. They can offer you more than that. And that's why these devices can work in either. So if you're connecting your device to a router, like a Cisco router, you don't need routing capability. In fact, it gets in the way. If the routing capability is turned on your cellular gateway, you want to turn it off into bridge mode. However, if you get out to your site and you want to use three or four different Ethernet devices, you want the device to be able to route. What's interesting now is that many high-end cellular gateways are now competing very well with traditional router companies, even in applications where they always would have used a router. So take a restaurant, for instance. If you had any number of restaurants, the IT guys managing them, they would put a router there, maybe a low-end one, but at least a router on site. Now you're starting to see cellular gateways used for that. So it's kind of interesting dynamic. Hopefully this uh, didn't bore you too much, and hopefully you stayed awake for most of this. As mentioned, next week we're going to walk through the seven cellular choices to connect this gateway you just bought. As always, love to hear from everyone. Our Facebook page is the best way to get a hold of me, the Internet of Things Made Simple. If we're connected on LinkedIn, that's a good place to start. And if we're personally connected, drop me an email or text. Thanks again. Talk soon. 